Hey everybody, Portland Chess Shop here to bring you the chess action, and we're going to be looking at a little bit of the mathematics of chess, if you will, looking at some of the geometries of the chess pieces. So I wanted to start with the knight, uh, which has some interesting mathematical characteristics. So the knight, let's start, let's start from the beginning. So the, there, there's a few different types of knights, right? The, so the knight in the center has how many possible moves? It has one, two, three, four, five six, seven, and eight. Now I know that sounds simple, but we're gonna get more complicated from here. So I want you to see that this is sort of a hexagon shape, right? Because there's eight, um, is it hexagon? No, octagon. This is sort of an octagon shape. Uh, but notice that it's not a like a symmetrical, well it is symmetrical. You can cut it across the, across the diagonals, across here, um, across here. It has a bunch of different points of axes in which you can cut across so that you could fold the other side uh, to make um, an equivalent shape. But at the same time, it's not a, um, all these angles aren't the same, right? This, this is a straight line that has a width of uh, two squares, and this is a straight line that has a width of approximately, I don't know, one and a quarter squares. So it's, uh, it looks a little bit like a triangle, but it's it's an octagon, but it's sort of an irregular octagon is the shape that this knight makes. So I do think that that's kind of interesting. It looks a little bit like an octopus or something when you look at it this way. And I'm going to pull this off so that we can look at some other things. So remember, a knight in the center has eight possible squares. And a knight over here, let's move this. Let's see. So if we pull a new thing, okay. So a knight on the side has four squares that it can move to, okay? So that's exactly half as many as a knight in the center. So when I'm always talking in my videos about, oh, he centralized the knight, I th you know, I su always support centralizing the knight. Well, that's because you have literally more possibilities with the knight in the center. The knight is like, in some sense, twice as good in the center as it is on the side, because it only has four possible squares here. And in the corner, it only has two squares, as you can see. And over here, um, it has three squares. So there's a, there's a different number of squares in which the knight can attack depending on where the knight is. So that's why knights are really good centralized. Uh, for example, just let me show you this real quick. In a lot of d4 openings, right, queen pawn, so here's the queen, queen pawn opening. Um, this knight sometimes uh, is able to go from here to here to here. And then when it's on this square, it controls eight squares like this, right? And it's really good. So I've had a lot of games recently in which uh, my opponent gets a knight here and sometimes they get a, they have a pawn here and a pawn here with their knight um, over here and it's just really good controlling a lot of squares in my base as well as defending squares within their own base. So th this is a little bit of why it's really good to have centralized knights. Um, let's take another example. Um, I know it's a little bit abstract but I figure that you can get you can bear with me. So let's see. Sometimes we have a pawn structure like this in the French defense, right? And let's take the queen off. We have a pawn structure like this. And sometimes the knight gets all the way up here. And the knight is pretty good because it controls... Oops, that, that's wrong, but I'm, you know what I mean. It controls a lot, a lot of squares. Um, some, some of those squares are really definitely in your opponent's base. These four squares are definitely in your opponent's base, and these four squares are pretty good auxiliary squares where it can jump back. So let's take this knight off. Let's uh, pull another knight in, pull these pawns off. And I want to show you something that I think is kind of deep about the knight. So remember that the knight moves in this octagon shape uh, when it's in the center. But let's think about it one move deeper, okay? So let's have a knight in the corner thinking about how many possible squares this knight has. So it has two squares versus eight, right? But what if you think about it one move deeper, or even two moves deeper? Let's take this off. Um, oops, I can't take those lines off. Wish I could change the color. But um, Let's see, let's pull it off, let's start over. So the knight's in the center and has eight squares, okay? So that's good. And then notice that these four squares are all equally centralized, 
Okay, because it's like on an axis. You can fold it across the top, fold it across the sides, and uh, any knife that's in here, if you fold it down and fold it over, topologically speaking, now that's another math term, you'll have the knife be on the same square if you fold it twice, right? So, but in the center, so it has eight squares. But what about in the second turn, right? Because often you're thinking multiple moves ahead with the knife. So, if you're thinking two moves ahead, well, how many squares does it have now? And now we have a much larger number, okay? So this is going to be, what, another 8, right? So it's going to have another 8 possibilities from there and another 8 possibilities from here, right? Because these are still centralized, centralized enough that it has another 8. But then on this square, it's only going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I might actually pull up my calculator. So we can do a little bit of the math. I swear, it's kind of cool. Um, so here's a calculator. And so far we have, I'll pull it down here so it doesn't get too far in the way. So 8 plus 8 plus 6. All right, so we got 22 so far, right? And now we're going to have to do it from here, this square. So from this square, it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. See how, see how crazy it is? So plus 6, all right, we're at 28. And now from this square, right, it has another 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, okay? So the knight's actually going to have eight different ways to come back to its original square, which is kind of interesting. Um, so we're going to add 6. All right, we're at 34. And now here, 1, 2, 3, four, five, six. Okay, we've got a lot of crazy lines already. It's um, So I'm trying to make a point, and I think that the point will be made. So we, now we have 40. Notice, like, for example, on this square, right, two different ways for the knight to get to this square within two turns. One is to go up and then back. The other is to go back and then up, okay? So just kind of interesting to see all the different uh, ways that this can happen. So here is another square that the knight can move. And this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Of course, it's 8 because it's another centralized square. So we add 8. Okay, we're at 48. Now from here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And we're uh, adding another 8 plus 8. All right, we're at 56. So did we cover all the squares? I think that we did. Okay? So if the knight is centralized, then it has eight possibilities on the first turn, but then 56 possibilities on the second turn. So there's got to be some sort of a mathematical formula in which we could uh, determine, you know, we could plug in, you know, plug in X, plug in Y, plug in, you know, a couple variables and find out exactly how many possibilities the knight will have on its different number of turns. And that would actually be like a number theory question that uh, might be, you know, a, a reasonable question for an upper level undergraduate student. So we've got 56 so far and we've drawn it all out and it looks kind of wild, right? I mean, look at this shape. This is some... This is, it looks a little bit like a fractal almost. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of things like the Mendelbrot fractal, which is something that has uh, infinite surface area and finite volume, right? So an ant could never crawl around it, but it's finitely small. And uh, with those things, you create like a 3D dimension of it. You should Google the Mendelbrot set if you haven't seen it for me yet. Look at like a YouTube video. And you can zoom into it. It's infinitely deep, but it recreates itself. It's got all these cool patterns and stuff. So let's just look at this um, one more, one move deeper. If we can, we can try. But we have 56 different squares, so we might not really be able to do it. We can notice from here, there's going to be four possibilities. From here, there will be... Um, I'm not even sure, one, two, three, four. That's kind of interesting that this square has four possibilities. So does this, right? This looks slightly more centralized, but it's not. So I really think that there is some somewhat deep things that we could be thinking about. And also coming up with that mathematical formula would be pr pretty interesting. So, and I mean, look at the shape, right? We've got some some funny 
almost squares in this, right? I mean, look at this. Lines. It almost looks like, look at this square right here. That is a trip. There's a square. There's a square. There's definitely a square. Lines here, li lines here, lines here, lines here, lines here, with co big connections here. And it's like, a, it's like squares. This is definitely very clearly a square with, uh, with this different different lines coming out of it it's not symmetrical like this side looks the same as this side but this side looks totally different this side is symmetrical to this side almost so I do think that this is I don't know kind of interesting so let's pull it off let's pull let's pull black knight put it over here and so it had 56 squares on the second turn I would like to calculate how many it has on the third turn I made one of my students in a chess lesson do it once kind of interesting so here, nice in the corner, has how many? Two moves. So we're going to clear. We're going to have two. Um, but that's just for the first. On the second rotation, it has one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? So 12 possibilities on the second turn, right? So let's do 12 over 56. Oh, sorry. Uh, 12 divided by 56 is 0.21. So you can kind of see that, you know, um, the knight only has two possibilities on the first, but has f has eight possibilities. Has Sorry, the knight has two possibilities from the corner, eight possibilities from the center. So there's a sense that in, in a single move, you know, two divided by eight is a is a quarter, right? So the knight is has twenty five percent the effectiveness within one move, but kind of within two moves, you see that the knight has less than twenty five percent effectiveness. So the knight becomes even less effective, looking more than one move deep with the knight. So I think that this is kind of deep because, you know, when I'm trying to teach a teach a student about. You know, knights on the rim are dim. That's the proverb, right? And it's not always because the knight is immediately dim on the rim, but because it has less potential possibilities within future moves. Kind of kind of interesting. Um, so we see that it only has 12 possibilities here. We could probably calculate this one move deeper. Let's see if we could. One, two, three, four. So let's see if we can do this. Four plus... And then the knight had a possibility here, right? So this is going to have eight. This is going to have eight twice. So eight plus eight plus eight, I think. Eight plus eight plus eight. Here, another eight plus eight plus. Here it has, what, six? One, two, three, four. No, it has four. Plus here it has uh, four. Plus, he, it, sometimes it goes out and then comes back in, and then it only has two. And then I don't think I calculated this one. This is another four. So you, I think that if I did the math right, the knight has 50 possibilities within three moves from the corner. But from the center, it has 56 possibilities within two moves. So you see that the knight has more possibilities within two moves from the center than it does within three moves from the corner. So in, in I don't know I I've been using some different analogies across different games I'm not sure if the audience follows it or totally appreciates it but in Magic the Gathering for example there's a magic card called Time Walk that g gives an extra turn after this one um, and it's one of the most powerful cards ever uh, the card is worth hundreds and hundreds of dollars um, it's considered one of the power nine one of the most powerful cards ever printed and you, there's a sense in which when you have a knight in the center you're sort of taking an extra turn after this one you have 56 possibilities within two moves where in, in the corner you only have 50 possibilities so there's sort of a sense in which you're able to take an extra turn um, or, or or you lose a turn if your knights in the corner something of that sort and uh, so I just wanted to show you guys a little bit about the knight and some of the mathematical possibilities. It'd be cool to uh, come up with that number theory um, about exactly how many different um, possibilities the knight will have over you know n different possible 
over n different moves. You know, so the knights in the center, and there's six moves. You know, six moves deep. How many possibilities would it be? And I'm sure it would be um, quite gargantuan at that point. So, uh, thanks for watching. Appreciate it, Portland Chess Shop. I think I'm gonna make another one on the bishop momentarily. So, appreciate it. Bye. A game of chess is like a sword fight. You must think first before you move.